Welcome to Lancefield on the Line. My name is David Lancefield and I'm delighted to welcome Peter Fisk, an author, consultant, keynote speaker, professor. You are the CEO of Genius Works. What a great name. An innovative <laughs> business accelerator based in London, the founder of the European Business Forum and the global director of Thinkers 50. As I said, you're a professor of leadership, strategy and innovation at the brilliant business school, the IE Business School in Madrid. I think it's a fantastic school where you are responsible for exec programs. You have, despite your youthful looks, which is probably down to your running and other healthy habits, <laughs> um, you have over 30 years of experience working with 300 companies and in 55 countries. I know you're a big traveler, so I'm, I'm, I know you're pleased to be getting back to travel. You worked at BA and PA Consulting, and you were the CEO of the Chartered Institute of Marketing. You're the author of nine books, nine books, the latest being Business Recoded, which I very much enjoyed and we're going to focus on today, which challenges leaders to have the courage to, if you like, find and develop and execute a better future, um, particularly in the post-pandemic world. And you've identified seven important shifts they need to focus on. And you've interviewed and, and, and reviewed a whole host of inspiring business leaders, often from out of, the, out of the realms of the norm, if you like, which is refreshing. Thanks ever so much for coming onto the show, Peter. David, it's fantastic to join you, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Pleasure, pleasure. So we're going to dive deep into your research, your experience, your views. I know you're not short of a perspective or two, put it that way. Um, <laughs> you've, uh, when, I, when, when I read through the book, you, if, if you like, studied and referred to some brilliant business leaders. Some I knew, some I didn't. I'm curious your process, if you like, of how you selected those leaders, particularly the ones that were not the you know, Satya Nadellas of the world. Um, and indeed, if you had to pick one, only one that inspired you the most, who would it be and why? Wow. OK, so I guess I'm really interested in companies, but I'm even more interested in the people behind the companies. So that's that's a stunning point. So leaders to me are really interesting, not just in terms of what they do, but how they think and how they got to the point of views, uh, which they then em embrace in terms of their strategies. So what I was looking for is companies who are shaking up the world, shaking up their markets. Um, so in classic sense, we call them disruptors, but they're not necessarily about technology disruption. They're, they're, they're disrupting the rules of the market. My previous book was called Game Changers. And so yes, I've been tracking yes. quite a lot of companies for a while. And you know, some, of, some, of the, some of the companies appeared in Game Changers. Many of them didn't, and they were, they were new to me as well. Um, and I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn about the, the, the new generation of companies who were doing things different ways and the new generation of business leaders. Mm -hmm. And so that was basically what I did. I formed a long list. From that list, I got a shorter list. Um, I then started contacting people. Um, I wanted to talk to people directly. So that filtered out a few people who weren't prepared to talk. Yes. But I wanted to understand their stories. And so um, that, was, that was really the process. Mm. So it's a qualitative process um it took me around the world a lot it took me um a lot to asia to be honest um, yes, quite yes. a bit quite a bit to south america there's some interesting companies there um and probably an equal balance between startups or scale-ups if you like um, companies who are kind of new um and companies who are the older giants who are reinventing themselves and using their scale but in, in new uh, creative ways hmm. so you know how do I choose one person? So in the book, <laughs> I, I talk about 50 people. Um, I know. Yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, I would choose, I mean, I'm tempted to choose Satya Nadella because you mentioned him, but I won't. I love um, the work he's been doing at Microsoft. Uh, I've experienced it firsthand. He's an incredibly um, human uh, an inspiring person. Um, I love the work which Mary Barra has been doing at GM in terms of reinventing the company. I love the work which Zhang Ru Min has been doing at Hire in terms of really having the, the boldness to both destroy his old business and to create a new business, which is really quite visionary. Um, yes. I love the stuff which Toby Lutka has been doing in terms of setting up Shopify, which transforms the world of retail. I love the work which Jane Franz Dreza has been doing at Citigroup. Um, but I'm not going to choose any of them. I'm going to choose um, <laughs> Anne Wojcicki. Um, mm. And, you know, what I, what, I, what I love about Anne Wojcicki's story is that she was... Um, she was an investment banker. She was doing research on Wall Street. She was looking at the next generation of companies. She was looking at all the financial reports and so on. 
and she looked at the future of healthcare. And all the reports were saying the future of healthcare is about data. And from data, it's about personalization. And it's a whole new generation, if you like, of, of healthcare solutions, yes. uh, both in terms of the pharmaceutical world, but also in the, in, in the care world. And she said, I want to make a difference to the world. And this is the way I can. And a bit like Jeff Bezos, almost um, a decade before her, she packed up her bags from Wall Street. She got into a camper van. She drove to the West Coast mm. and she set up um, a company called 23andMe. Um, at the time, it cost $9,000 to profile somebody's DNA. She right. simplified the process. Um, she changed the business model, interestingly, not just the technology, mm. um, so that um, there's different types of revenue flows. And from that, she reduced from 9,000 early initially to 900, and then eventually to $99 to profile somebody's DNA. And you know that whole way of thinking, not just from a technological or scientific view, yes. but also from a business model point of view in terms of how can I make this more accessible to more people. Mm. And then most recently over the last two years, particularly accelerated by the, the challenges of a global pandemic, how can I flow this, this understanding of people's DNA because they like it to understand their, their ancestry and so on. Yes. Um, but the real thing is, how do you move to personalized medicines? And uh, over the last 18 months, she's been incredibly successful working with companies like uh, Almiral in Spain and GSK in the UK in, in creating a new generation of, um, of, of personalized uh, drugs, including antiviral drugs uh, for, for COVID. So she, for me, uh, was the leader who truly inspired me. That's a brilliant answer. Wow, there's a lot there. You hedged your bets a bit at the beginning, but fair enough. You went down on one. That's an inspiring story. She's done a great, a great job. I know a bit of it, but obviously learned more from you. If you were one of the existing or aspiring leaders that were looking up to these individuals and had read your book, I imagine you'd be both inspired and probably a bit overwhelmed uh, as to, wow, that's a big jump if you were self-aware from where we are already. Yeah. What in your experience are the biggest, if you like, obstacles that get in the way of leaders not only thinking bigger and recoding themselves and their businesses, but actually doing it in practice? I think the biggest obstacle leaders have is letting go of the past. Um, so being able to kind of let go of the thing which made them successful. And that goes both at a corporate level and as at an individual level as well. You know, we look at so many companies and, and the reason why these huge companies like the GEs of the world, for example, are really struggling in today's world is because they keep hanging on to the model which made them successful 10 or yes. 20 years ago. Yes. And they're so reluctant to, to, to let go of it. So they want to keep tweaking it. They want to keep trying to make it slightly better, but based on the same fundamental principles which made them successful mm. in, a, in a past world, which is, you know, in, in most cases, quite different from today. So I think Sorry? letting go of the past uh, mm. is really a, a big challenge uh, at a corporate level, but it also works for the individual. <laughs> Yes. And so letting go of what made you successful to think about, well, how will you be more successful? And that goes for leaders, particularly as they have to move through the functional ranks of a business and they have yes. to get towards the CEO. And essentially, they have to play the old game, um, the old political game, the old internal politics game. Um, and then they have to they get to this point of CEO and they want to take the organizations to a new place, not the, not not just stay where where their, their previous CEO was 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 taking the business, but take it further forwards. And to do that, they have to change in some way. They have to change their outlook, their mindset, their perspective, maybe their capabilities and so on as well. And I think it's the courage to let go of the past and to create a future, both organizationally and individually, which is the biggest. Uh, blocker the biggest challenge for, for business leaders yeah. absolutely right there's a lot of vulnerability in that transition as well personal vulnerability and as i say courage to take risks and get things wrong so if you were one of those individuals that had sort of <laughs> was moving through the ranks you yeah. let go or you were letting go of your past organizationally and personally and the business was ticking over it was fine you know there were, we were not in a financial crisis um at all but you wanted to spark your curiosity. You wanted to explore new spaces, new business models and so forth. And you'd read all the books, you'd read your book and you'd <laughs> done the courses. Where do you start? Because I, I know the reason I asked that is I know 
and work with a number of leaders who have the right intention are full of ideas, but some of their challenges focusing out, okay, so where, what's the first step do I take to you know, exploration, if you like? What, what, what well, have you I, seen this work? I think, I think you know, there's, there's always the first 100 days, and, and, and that's really true, and I've experienced myself as a CEO, you know, the power of the first 100 days when you have this honeymoon period, you have this moment when people are, are curious about you, but they're also waiting to hear from you. And you have a moment when you really can start to make things happen. Mm -hmm. um, what I see where people fail during that first 100 days is when they start to impose their own ideas immediately on the organization. Mm -hmm. What I see when people succeed in those first 100 days is where they start to listen, um, but to listen in a way which brings particularly their top team together. So, you know, uh, you need to bring the whole organization, you need to listen to everybody, but bringing that top team together, I think that's what uh, leaders probably still don't do enough of, and building a common view of the future. Um, you know, when I was working in a consulting firm, um, I, I worked with McKinsey, I worked with PA Consulting, you mentioned, the, the model was always for, for the consulting firm to come up with the report. You know this, uh, mm. you've worked in consulting firms, mm. and come up with the report, which then you give to the, to the CEO or to the executive team, here's what we think you should do. Mm. But it's never owned, it's never owned by that team. Yes. And what I've really found has worked most successfully is when the team itself owns their vision of the future. Absolutely. And, and, and the CEO, if you like, is the facilitator almost of that process, not the dictator of that process. Mm. And you know, really takes the time to listen to each person. Each person expresses their own views, all these ideas they've got in, the, in, in terms of their, uh, you know, uh, in their heads, but they've never been able to express before. Mm. And they build this common view as to where we're going. And, and most, most leaders and, and leadership teams don't spend enough time doing that. And yes. if you can get the leadership team itself with a clarity of where they want to go and where they don't want to go, so you know, black and white, um, and if you can then get them to kind of start to prioritize what's the most important things on that journey and the stepping stones or the horizons, if you like, on that journey, then you're in a great place to move forwards yes. in a new way. And you're doing it with the backing of the whole team. You're showing that you're listening. You're taking the organization. You're not just, just taking yourself forwards. And, and you're likely to be more successful. Yeah, absolutely right. I think the, the practice of effective and attentive listening in that process you just described and the willingness for people to express their ideas, their views on problems in their own ways sounds like a, a normal human thing to do. But in the rush to get to that next output or milestone, people, I think, often skate over those those important processes. And as a result, people will nod and say yes to things, but actually they're not really bought in. I think we've probably both seen that ourselves. Yep. I mean, you if I take it back a level, if you you you, you know, set out a number of shifts, seven shifts, big shifts. And obviously we've been, we've it feels like we've gone through a number of shifts over the last 18 months or more. And some <laughs> of them have been accelerated by the pandemic. And frankly, where, depending on where in your world you are listening and watching this at the moment, you're experiencing that firsthand. Um, if you had to speak to a CEO of a board of a typical company, this is a very general point, which would be the most material shifts or shifts that you think deserve their attention right now? It's a great question. And I would be tempted this is not my answer. I would be tempted to say. Um, <laughs> I love the way you, I love the way you give a little bit of a taster, <laughs> and then you come back around the corner. Wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. So here it is. Um, I would be tempted to say um, recode the organisation because it's the people who are going to take you to the next place and, and all that stuff. So um, I, I acknowledge the importance of that, but I think what's even more important is that transition to recode your future. Hmm. So why do I say that? Well, I think we're at this, this, this moment where we're, we're coming out of a pandemic. Um, the pandemic has shaken everything up. It's accelerated some trends. It's kind of disrupted uh, many conventions of before. And it's, we all know it's not about coming back to what we did before. It's, it's about moving forwards perhaps in, in new ways. Yes. And that's the big opportunity. <laughs> that's the big opportunity mm. of the pandemic. Um, but what's, what's really important is to change your future potential. 
And in the book, I talk about the, the, the phrase future potential, which yes. I haven't actually heard myself before, but um, that, I, that, that was important to me. Um, in terms of how do you see the future and what is the scope by which you see the future potential of your business? Yeah. And the reason for that is I work with many CEOs and, and many of them look at their future potential largely through the lens and through the lines, the, the boundaries of their existing business and the way it's been defined in the past. Yes, and I'm talking yes. about the sector description. We're an yes. energy company, we're a yeah. transport company, we're a retail company. And by changing your perspective, you can change your future potential. By looking forward to new ways, by seeing the world in a, in a different sense, maybe by not looking at products and defining your, your business by products and the, the mm. things which you make, but by seeing your customers and the things which they're trying to do, then you can reframe, you can re-articulate, you can redefine what market you're in mm. now and into the future. And, and you can see that, particularly through, through the last two years, you can see you know, retailing and gamification and finance, for example, with companies like C in Singapore, Pinduoduo in China, you know, the fusion of different sectors, being mm, able yeah. to look at the world in different ways. You know, Elon Musk describes Tesla, formally describes it as an energy company, actually. That's the, their purpose statement, is to accelerate the future of, of clean energy. We all think of it as, a, as an automotive or a, a mobility company. Yes. He stood up on stage the other day and defined it as an AI company. So <laughs> yes. you can define your company or you can define your marketplace anywhere you want to. So being able to think about what is your future potential, what is the, the lens by which you're going to see your future, I think is really important. And then having the courage, having the, the confidence to jump to that future, not just to stand back and see it from where you are now and then say, how are we going to work towards it incrementally, but to, to leap to the future and to think about what is that future I want to be like? What, what future do I want to work in? And how will my company and how will I or we as a team, how will we shape that future to our advantage, to the way we want it to be? And then work backwards. So future back thinking, if you like, yes. um, in terms of being able to think about what is the future we want to create? And then how do we start creating it? And, and suddenly next year is not an extension of this year, you know, a little bit better than last year. Yeah, it's not like um, a budgeting process. It's a problem. Yeah, so it's not 10% more than last year. It's suddenly the starting, the first stepping stone towards a new place, a better place. I really like that. How, how on the leap front that you just referred to, often I, I see that as the, where things fall down. You, you, you have the future perspective, however you do it, and mm -hmm. people are energized, intrigued, have a big ambition to take the organization into new spaces. Yeah. Uh, and then the reality bites, and one person wants to leap, but somebody else thinks, ah, you know what, actually, but, and the buts may be ever, very personal. Ah, that doesn't help my, my, my incentives because I'm, I'm bonused on quarterly earnings, very specific thing. Or actually, do we have the confidence in the organization, the capability? So what have you seen that's worked that, to help people, if you like, actually leap? from if you like mentally and actually as an organization beyond thinking forward and then working back what have, what are the is it setting up new ventures is it um experimenting with third parties what have you seen that's worked um i think it's it's a couple of things so firstly from a kind of strategy framework point of view then you know i i'm a big fan of mckinsey's horizons model i mentioned it a moment ago so if you do leap to the future, then being able to work back and to, to, to start to map out your horizon, so your longer term horizon, so maybe your five year, then your three year, then your one year horizon, mm -hmm. and to make those tangible and still working with that team of people, not, not the strategy department by itself, um, not a bunch of consultants by themselves, but as a leadership team, maybe facilitated, um, working through what those horizons are, which means what are the priorities and what are the logical stepping stones. So mm. give you an example, I was working with a textile company, so making clothing. Um, the, the, the fashion industry is in turmoil at the moment. If you look at high streets, for example, and constantly diminishing prices and so profits likewise. So, so what do they do? They have to do something fundamentally different. So you know, they started off with a, a vision, a, a future back uh, perspective, which is they wanted to create a sustainable fashion brand for, for the next generation. 
how do they do that? Well, part of it is in terms of um, uh, how do we reach these people and what do these people want? And so yes. they explored direct to consumer channels, for example. So changing the channel model by which they did. So not going through intermediaries anymore. Part of it was about sustainability in terms of, well, how do we actually make and dye and, 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 and produce these fabrics? Um, another part of it is then the creative design process. Who does that? What's the ecosystem by which it works? So you've got a whole series of different questions. Yes, yes. Which one comes first? <laughs> Which ones is most important both to sustain the existing business and its its cash flows so that you actually do have a future so that you, you get towards this future business? And going through those kinds of questions, which ones do we want to do? Which ones will give us a competitive advantage? Which ones will give us the cash to support the future investments? All of those kind of questions, you need the whole team together, the ops guy and the marketing guy yes, and the finance guy. Yep. Yeah. And and then they can work through these painful, difficult trade-offs to get to their dream. And if that dream is a collective dream, they all work to want to work through the pain in order to get there. Right. Let's let's build on that in terms of roles in that process. You've talked about different roles and you have you are you're a marketeer by background and spirit, although I know you do lots of things and wear different hats, but you said, and I quote, the CMO is the pathfinder to make sense of these fast changing, uncertain and disrupted markets and to champion the growth plan. Isn't that the role of the chief strategy officer as well? He says quizzically. As a, as a strategist, yes. <laughs> well, I, I'll wear any hat you like if you like, but I have a strategy background, yeah. But I'm curious, sort of in a way, how the CMO CMO role evolves and how it correlates with other C-suite roles. That's where I'm I'm getting to. He says. Okay, Tim. I guess I, I mean I'm being provocative, but I know. The, Good. The the point is that change happens outside, not inside. Today, in the past, I mean I remember 25 years ago, I was working in organisations. You were always having to create change from the inside, and it was largely to do with efficiency. And you know, change programs were driven because we want to do them because they're good for us internally. Mm. Change programs today are done because the outside world is changing incredibly fast, and we've got to mm. keep up or we want to move ahead, we're going to seize a new opportunity. The dynamic is outside, not inside. The people who understand the outside world the best to me are or should be the marketers, mm. the people, and that should be their real big job to understand not just the existing customers, but the future customers, not just the existing marketplace, but the future marketplace. And so understanding where, where's the change, where's the opportunity for change in that future space. That's why I think a, a good CMO should be a pathfinder. They should be the person exploring this future, they're looking for new categories, looking for new segments of consumers, looking for new geographical markets, and then saying, these, I think, are the best opportunities. Yes. And, and don't come back and just say, we can sell more, but talk about how this is actually the growth pathway for the organization. You know, and, um, you know. That's a big I shift for, for many CMOs. I, I, I sort of worked with them. They weren't always my direct clients. But for many of them, that's a pretty big shift in their focus and their capabilities. For many of them, they get obsessed to to be honest they get obsessed with their advertising and that's been the traditional biggest problem of a cmo yes. <laughs> is that they fall in love with their ad agency they fall in love with their ads we all know that advertising in itself is fundamentally evolved to a digital world and it's very different from what it used to be but but still they they, they love their creative if you like mm. what they really should be doing and what the best cmos i see in the world doing are the ones who are actually developing a growth plan for the organization. Yes. You know, I worked with, I worked with Coca-Cola in Atlanta, was it 15, 15, 16 years ago? And we were working on the marketing plan, the global marketing plan for the organization. And it was at the very last minute, we'd done all this analysis and we'd involved all the different regions of the world. And then we were taking it to the, to the CEO and the exec team. And we said, well, is it right calling it a marketing plan? What is it we're trying to achieve from this? <laughs> and, and, and they said, well, just make sure the budget doesn't get cut. And, <laughs> and, I'm going, and I'm going, well, surely we don't want the budget to be cut. We want more budget because if you get more budget, you get more revenue. Mm. And so the point really was to reframe or to relabel the, the marketing plan as a growth plan. Because yes. when we then went into the boardroom with a growth plan, 
everybody said, well, how can we have more of it? Not how can we have less of it? Yes, indeed. And, <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. So, um, so in a sense, they're re 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 reframing their profession or their, 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 their added value to the organization. Let's, let's delve into a little bit more about you then. I, one, I, I like and admire many things about you, Peter, as we're getting to know each other. One of them is your curiosity for uh, companies, individuals, industries, ecosystems outside the norm, which is often in books and in speeches defined in North American and European terms. And you referred yes. earlier to parts of Asia and, and uh, South America. Why, why and where? Do, why do you focus on that space, and what particularly intrigues you about those regions of the world? Because newness happens in the margins, not mainstreams. I That's it. Said, That's the answer. I, Brilliant. I've no, I've no idea who said that. Maybe I said it, but um, <laughs> That's great. I think okay, that's you know, the answer. That's the answer. Yeah. That's so, um, so it, it is looking in a different way at the world, and it's looking for what happens next as opposed to what happened last. And in the last, building on that as a segue, over the last eighteen months, two years, how have you practiced yourself what you preach? I'm always curious how management thinkers, authors, speakers, consultants they they talk about these shifts in the way you you have eloquently, and some do it themselves or relevant to their business and their their brand and candidly some talk a good game but then they look at themselves and frankly they're not doing what they're saying which I, I i have a i have a slight issue with in terms of in you know integrity and coherence so i know you're a, an agile dynamic person what have you shifted yourself over the last 18 months to two years wow okay um beyond virtual that's working that's the obvious answer beyond virtual yeah working. yeah honest answers um well, I have shifted my perspective. I think that's 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 a really important thing. You know, I I start off with reading the Singapore Times uh, in the morning, which is, oh, which is wow. Quite so um, you know, so so I've done a lot of work in Singapore, for example. Um, I think you know that, in a sense, is still a great kind of um, gauge of what's happening across Asia, um, and so what's happening in China, what's happening in Japan, and and, and many of the markets. So being able to understand those Asian markets has been really important to me over the last couple of years. And yes. so not just understanding the companies and so, you know, amazing companies, you know, we all, we all probably know Alibaba and Tencent's story, but how do, how well do we know Ping Ang or Pin Duoduo or DBS's stories, th those kind of companies too. Um, and in many senses, these companies are now the most innovative companies in the world. They really are. They're ahead of the game. And yes. they're, certainly, they're certainly not um, learning from the West. <laughs> the West needs to learn from them today. So, so that's, that's the big thing I forced myself to do more. Um, learning from their culture, not just learning from their businesses. So that's quite interesting. Um, my wife's family is Chinese. And so that gives me a little bit of an inroad into um, understanding mm -hmm. that culture. Um, but understanding, you know, you, we see it sometimes in popular books like Ikigai, for example, the, the, mm. the wholeness of individual purpose. Yes. Or, um, or uh, as the Olympics were happening in, in Tokyo, I, I took a real focus in terms of what is it which drives Japanese athletes, where they have more successful marathoners in the world than from any other country. Yes. Um, and what is it which drives that? And for example, the story of Japanese monks who, who, who run 100 marathons in 100 days in order to get to a better place spiritually. And I discovered wow. the, the, the concept of Jijami. And Jijami is, is a Japanese resilience, um, which starts to explain, you know, uh, my, uh, what is they and um, Maya Son's uh, approach to soft bank investments over a hundred year period, for example, yes. or it explains why Fuji, uh, Fuji film has constantly evolved from the days when it was successful in cameras. It let go of that kind of thing, which disappeared um, and it evolved into medical imaging, into cosmetics, into pharmaceuticals and so on over time. So it has a resilience to keep finding new ways of doing things. So the, the culture often gives you something new. Um, the, the other thing which I've really um, spent a lot of time doing over the last two years is, is learning a lot more from startups. Um, so right. startups, um, both in um, the, the classical sense of technology startups, but particularly in sustainable startups. I work with an organization called Circlo. Um, right. And Circlo is really a, it's really an accelerator 
um, for tech sustainable startups Great. and working with the, the founders and the teams in those organizations for free um, is as much a learning experience for me. I don't tell them that, um, but it's also uh, obviously a learning experience for them. That's that's why they want me to work with them. And so being able to kind of learn from them as, I, as I'm helping them to develop, I think is really, really interesting. And then you know, really being able to take those ideas to larger organizations who are now desperately saying, you know, how can I embrace yes. technology for good? How can I become a platform for good in this world? And, you know, I can, I can still be successful profitably and I can still create great products and services, but also I can make a bigger contribution to society and the environment at the same time. I love your genuine curiosity and <laughs> thirst for, for learning in, as I say, in the margins, not the mainstream and, and in yeah. new places and probably in spaces that you don't know so much about, but actually having a new, a fresh mindset, asking questions and, and curiosity as opposed to just spinning out the same, same old stuff. So let's delve even deeper as we, as we bring this to a close. How do you measure your impact? And if you were to look at yourself and write a memo, perhaps to yourself in a few years time, I'm sure you'll still be working, you'll still be running. I'm not sure about the 100 marathons a day, but you never know. No, uh, no. 100 marathons, <laughs> sorry, 100 marathons and 100 days, I should say. But if you had to write a memo to yourself about the, if you like, the impact you'd like to have in, you know, in your professional life, how would you describe it? How would you describe your impact? And what do you want people to say about you? Um, I think, I think it's about progress. You know, I was searching for a new word. Um, and obviously, obviously organizations, um, measure, measure themselves and profit. And now we all talk about purposeful profit, um, mm. as, as a, as a more enlightened way in which we kind of achieve financial success. And as an individual, you know, I, I look at the money I earn, uh, mm. if I'm honest, and that's part of the measure of the impact in some ways, which I can have people, people value my ideas, they buy my books, they buy my time. And so, you know, that's one measure. But I think it's, it's progress, you know, not just profit, not just purpose, but progress, which is really interesting. Do I help people to progress? Now, that might be, do I help them to get to a new place? Um, do I help them to develop a new project, to develop a new perspective, which they didn't have before? Um, you know, a personal feeling of success is when I walk off stage after doing a, a keynote speech and, and, and lots of people will come and say, that was so inspiring. That's nice. But I also want them to do something about it. Yes. Um, so, you know, to take away and to do something about it. So, so making personal or organizational progress, I think, is, is the really big thing. So you know, one of the great, you know, I, I work as a keynote speaker. I work as a as business school professor and as a consultant. And one of the great things of those longer term projects, for example, at business school, then we have a, a six month program, which then people kind of join a community, which they stay yes. in touch and they, they stay involved. Um, you get to know what they're doing and the things which mm. happen during those six months um, when I work with them, typically change their lives. Mm. And when they walk away from the business school, they're full of ideas. And actually, I work with them on a game changer project, which turns into a game changer venture, which is something which is about how they see the future of their business and they can make it happen. But what I really want to hear about is how they actually do it <laughs> and yes, they, they go about yes, and, and start yes. to make it happen so like like the like the textile company for example we we did all the the boardroom discussions in terms of the horizon planning and all the rest of it but it's when i saw their sustainable dye mill being built and they'd invested mm, very, um, tangible, you know, very tangible a number of a number of well, hundreds of millions of dollars invested in that whole process when i saw them as a textiler who previously just made clothes for other brands, they launched their own brand um, and they launched it digitally. That was a great feeling of, of accomplishment because I know it was you know, with my help through changing their perspectives, perspectives, changing their mindset, they were able to move forwards in a new way. And hmm. you, know, you mentioned Satya Nadella at the beginning and you know, I've spent probably the last three, four years working with Microsoft quite a lot. Um, in terms of helping them to transform their, their practical business. And Satya Nadella has a purpose statement, which says you know, that his organization, he sees the organization existing to enable every person and every organization to do things they could never do before. Mm. And 
And that to me is really important. How can I help people to move forwards, to step up and to do things they could never do before? That's uh, an inspiring, optimistic <laughs> note to close. I love the emphasis on progress as well as purpose and profit. And clearly you have amazing examples and many people's lives professionally and personally would have been better for working with you closely, Peter. That's a wonderful conversation, very wide ranging. Uh, we went all around the world and to you as well. <laughs> I'm always keen to understand the individual in front of me here. Um, where can people find out more about you and your work and your endeavours, Peter, online? Okay, simplest way is my website, peterfisk.com. Uh, Twitter is at GeniusWorks or LinkedIn, of course. Um, or you can subscribe to my newsletter, which um, I love doing and sharing with people. It comes out each month. Um, it's called Fast Leader. And you can uh, send me an email, peterfisk at peterfisk.com, and I'll send you the newsletter. That's a very rich resource. I read it carefully and thoughtfully. It's very rich and di differentiated, as you would expect from somebody you. from your background. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Peter. I've thoroughly enjoyed today. And that was another edition of Lancefield on the Line. Thank you, David.